I'm going to ask a weird question. How do we know what makes a good Final Fantasy game? On the surface, I believe there's many people who could say pretty confidently that the games from their youth are so clearly good to Final Fantasy. People citing the original game, or more commonly Final Fantasy IV, or VI, or Now That I'm a Withered Crone, FF10 is another common one. This line of thought tends to also be paired with a common, unspoken understanding that modern Final Fantasy is bad. It's bloated and very pretty, but the plots are convoluted and they just don't have that ephemeral thing that the series from our childhood years had. If pushed, more often than not, people will cite FF12, 13, or 15 as the biggest culprits of bloated, bad, confusing modern times, exempting 11 and 14 in all cases for being MMOs. Even though I've been playing Final Fantasy XI for the past few months, and that game can get bloated, confusing, and unintuitive real fast, the idea of a modern Final Fantasy title seemingly cannot escape these conventions, or at least they weren't able to until the newest one came out, but time will tell. It is also just as likely that entropy will set in, and years down the line people will consider it the same way, though, you know, I'd love to be proven wrong. Part of the struggle of Final Fantasy XV is that there's a lot of people that talk about it indirectly. Looking around, the bulk of the talking points are whether or not it works as an open world game, if the gameplay is good, and then uh, the unfolding lotus blossom of its development, how it used to be Final Fantasy versus 13 before the project was scrapped and parts of it were repurposed into Final Fantasy 15, how you have to watch the movie and play all the DLC to understand the story, put a pin in it, we'll get back to that, how because of you needing to consume all the disparate parts of it, the story can never be finished because there's a collection of DLC that was fully cancelled. This is the kind of discourse trap that I'm struggling with here. None of it really talks about the game, its story, what it's trying to say, and that's a shame because Final Fantasy XV is fucking bizarre. It's a game that has easily one of the strongest fantasy aesthetics I've seen in a while, but it's also hard to not read this game in the context of the last single-player title, the highly polarized Final Fantasy XIII, which was the first title to unambiguously feature a female protagonist. Please don't leave a comment about Final Fantasy VI. It advertised itself as an ensemble cast, and yes, it's kind of Terra and Celeste's story, but I feel like the difference between game with huge cast that centers on Terra for a bit, then Locke, then Celeste, and the main character of this game is this woman named Lightning is obvious. <clears throat> And now, Final Fantasy XV isn't just a story with a male lead, but it's the first time there's been an all-male main party... ever? Final Fantasy XV ramps up to some of the boldest game design choices in the second half, something I referenced in a previous video, and then the excellent ramping up slams entirely up against the worst final chapter I've ever seen in the entire series, with a final final moment that lives in my head, rent-free, forever. It is a mindfuck of a game, and I'm glad that everyone's talking about Final Fantasy XVI, how horny and or straight it may or may not be, how good the dog is, how fucked up and full of swears and gay sex it is, but I don't have a PS5, and I think it's important to consider Final Fantasy XV, what it wanted to say, how its developers thought about it, advertising it in a loading screen for the game's title as a Final Fantasy for fans both new and old. And importantly, I'm not going to be talking about the DLC. I'm broke, I'm not going to buy a bunch of DLC, and on principle, the story is perfectly comprehensible without it. What happened to Gladio in the moment he leaves the party for a bit? If it was critical to the story to know, they would have told us. He came back with some scars, and you can have fun finding that out, but th they didn't pay well understanding the story. I I'm sorry. So a good place to start talking about this game is probably contextually, which means, and long-term fans of my channel may be begging me to please stop talking about it, but I'm in control here, this is my YouTube, and I'm gonna talk about Final Fantasy XIII. You're gonna have to make your peace with that. The impulse that I've held in my heart for a very long time was that Final Fantasy XV was made as kind of a response to the negative critical reception XIII had, where critics often complained about the game's linearity and confusing jargon and lack of towns and traditional RPG elements, Final Fantasy XV gives you a literal car to drive around and a big open world to explore with towns and side quests aplenty, where FF13 is this kind of campy, over-the-top, hyper-stylized cyberpunk setting. 
15 is bloody and deeply modern with cities and cars and gas stations and the like, where there was criticism of the characters, particularly of Lightning being knockoff Cloud and a bit of a cold bitch, the main party of 15 has no women in it at all. It's tempting to draw this contrast, but that muddies the waters. Western critics were harsh on it, but it was well received in Japan and sold a lot of copies. It strains belief that a company would decide to force the next big project down the pipe to be almost a deliberate inverse mirror of a generally well received game, right? Well, yeah, but it is much easier to think about it this way once you realize that this game used to be Final Fantasy Versus 13, part of a cluster of video games in the setting of Final Fantasy 13, along with Agito 13, which then turned into Type Zero, which I haven't played yet, I'm sorry. Versus 13 was made to be kind of a deliberate contrast to the original trilogy, and a lot of these choices carried over when it was converted into FF15. So these choices are deliberate on some level, but maybe not as a result of like Spoony One and Yahtzee making popular videos dunking on 13. What has changed from this, though, is interesting. See, this development hell explains a lot of the mechanical choices. An open world, a limited relationship with magic, the much more mature presentation what with the blood and such. And hey, look, you, you caught me talking about the development stuff. You see how easy it is to end up just like not really talking about this game? Uh, look, the transition of this game from one project to another can explain some things, but it doesn't neatly explain the first real issue lingering in this game's presentation. So. Final Fantasy XV feels masculine. Like, yes, it's a party of dudes, a, a man fest, a guy serenade, a bro nato. I'll, I'll stop, I'm sorry. Wait, a male strum. Okay, I'm done. But you can have a bunch of guys and not give off this kind of vibe. There's tons of guys in Disco Elysium, but that game doesn't feel masculine like this one does. Where the superficial elements can be understood in the context of its development, there's not a lot of the development that explains this vibe. Like, like remember the Omen trailer? Like, there is an urge in this game's presentation to make it dark and grim and bloody. Uh, there's a part where ten years of time pass and Noctis returns to the world cast in perpetual darkness like that time in The Wind Waker. Uh, but it's all uh, full of demons. It's all grim. Your gas station starting point has turned into a military base. The city of Insomnia has been like action movie ruined. If it sounds like I'm struggling here, meandering, etc., it's because it's kind of a hard point to express by itself. Remember Erba? Final Fantasy XIII also had the task of making a ruined world that our party has arrived to after a lot of time has passed. They've actually set themselves to this task in all three of these games. And look at the kinds of things they've considered to be a post-apocalypse setting. A city abandoned and swept away into crystal sand. A tower that houses the memories of people, all of whom have died in this timeline. An entire world birthed out of chaos where no one ages, no new life is born, and the planet spends the next five centuries slowly dwindling away. Just some of the most unhinged shit you could think about. And FF15's answer to this is The Last of Us's cityscapes, if it was always dark out. It's a petty complaint, but like, you know, while we're here, do, do we want to talk about women? <laughs> we go forward in time 10 years and, and all the women are gone. There's no more women here. There's no more women here, like, like right now, uh, sorry. They're still alive or whatever. Well, uh, you know, most of them. FF15 has like four, I want to say, major female characters. Uh, Luna Freya, Noctis' fiance in the Oracle. Iris, uh, Gladio's little sister, Aranea, the Dragoon General that you fight against briefly before she sort of helps you out for most of the rest of the game, and Cindy, Sid's granddaughter who helps you repair your car. The game wants to tell you that these women are cool, interesting, thoughtful characters. Two of them even have DLC chapters. Well, <laughs> they did, but they were cancelled. I feel a little... I feel a little odd here. I like Final Fantasy XV, actually, but there's something about this game that makes me go, like... Like, just a little Feminism 101 here? Luna Freya is important. She does a lot in that movie I never watched. She, she, she's, she's important, but the text of the game kind of needs to tell us up front that, because she doesn't really show up that much until we get to Altitia, where she does a big speech, helps you with the Leviathan, and then gets killed by Arden. Like, she looms in Noctis's mind for the remainder of the game, sure, but it, it kind of sucks that her role is to help with one fight, give him his dad's ring and a cool trident, and die, so that he can be miserable and kind of a dick to the party in the next chapter. This is combined with 
Iris and Cindy, uh, two other girls that are close to the party, but don't really do much. Cindy helps you with the car and the boat. Uh, she's dressed like this, which, whatever, like, I'm not going to judge. Iris has a couple of great scenes. She's actually an interesting character. She's Gladio's younger sister, so she's being trained to be a royal guard like him. She's worried about the various interconnecting problems, the death of the king, and, and then you're put on a boat. And she leaves the story forever, until ten years later, where she's mentioned as this cool fighter, Demon Slayer Eris. Where is she? Oh, she's like, out. She's busy. A childhood friend of Noctis, who has been missing for a literal decade, uh, going on a mission that will literally kill him, and uh, she's out doing important things. And the last of the gals, Aranea? Well, she fights you once, she helps you get Mithril, she lets her men take you on a train to Gralia, and then she is also gone. Off screen, she's doing stuff. She did stuff in the Prompto DLC, but that stuff culminated in, and then Prompto got kidnapped and slotted back into the main story. Uh, the game's relationship with the women in it has a hairline fracture down the spine. It wants us to know that women are powerful, independent, interesting figures in this world, but also none of them get to have a real weight in you and your party's journey. They're there to give Gladio a little sister to get worried about, for Prompto to have two women to have a crush on, to make Noctis miserable over his fiance's death. Oh, right, Gentiana. Right, sorry, there's one more major female character, the mystical, enigmatic woman Gentiana that seems to show up whenever and never age. She's an icon. No, uh, Idolan, no. Astral? An... An astral? Uh, she's a summon spirit. Shiva. Here they are. Uh, all mostly naked. Numerous of them. All here. Look, I I'm not gonna judge. The point here is that the game feels distinctly like a story that hadn't really considered the role of women in it until they looked back and realized that they're basically here to be kind of sexy fighters, love interests, or killed for the sake of twisting the knife into our main character. Then they tried to, like, go back and kind of flesh their presence out a little. You can do like a side quest with Iris in your party. She fights with the big Moogle plush toy because she's great. Aranea not only has a main quest mission with you, but you know, she'll randomly join your party out in the field while you're not doing anything important. It's a meager compensation for a game that has a clear focus. We're not here to have a story like Final Fantasy XIII, full of sentimentality, of holding on to people you love in a world that is bizarre and shifting and magical, uh, but a hard, grim story about darkness and the people that sacrifice themselves for you, the main character, while you go through pain and struggle and death and violence to return light to the kingdom. Or is it? Okay, so... I need to establish why I like this game still, why I still call this a good game. I, I like the effort that they put into the party dynamic through this game. The four of them are kind of constantly talking to each other back and forth for all the open world half of the game. Everyone has a role, they all have skills they use that aren't combat focused. Cooking, fishing, photography, s survival, whatever, Gladio. But it makes the four of them have a lot of time. You're out there, camping, foraging, exploring weird caves, you're having fun. This is good too. One of the strengths of Final Fantasy XV is in its aesthetic. The modern fantasy setting is indulgent and pristine, and god, I, I love it so, so much. I think a lot about what side quests in a narrative-based story wants to achieve, and FF15's combat isn't so, so dynamic and complex that I find myself compelled to go around doing things for the sake of doing more sick combat. But what I think what FF15's open concept side questing hubs give us is time. And they use that time very well. It's a balancing act, and not one done perfectly, but you work yourself into a cycle. You get familiar with the kinds of things everyone says, what they like, you judge Prompto's picture taking. It's good. It's particularly good as the game starts to complicate it, too. Like, it starts small. You know, what if you walk around with Kor in your party, too? Hi, Matt Mercer. Uh, what if you have to babysit Iris? What if Gladio leaves to do his DLC? Uh, what if you have to play with Aranea? It's small at first, but once you go to Alticia, you fight Leviathan, Lunafreya dies, and Ignis is blinded for the rest of the game. I... I'm gonna try and be delicate here because there's like disability politics to be had here. Ignis takes his blindness in stride, but it doesn't like it still makes him kind of not 
a relevant figure in combat anymore, at least until he gets his cool new move, which gives him like a limited combat utility. After that though, you get tricked by Arden and push Prompto off a train for his DLC chapter, leaving you with just an injured Ignis and a pissed off Gladio and an emotionally distraught Noctis. And it is in this state that Arden strikes again, locking all of Noctis' weapons, and in the ensuing escape separates him from Gladio and Ignis. He's alone, unarmed, sneaking in the dark. I've kind of written this section in a previous video of mine, uh, go check it out. But I want to restate here that this is excellent. The game smartly breaks its own gameplay loop to frustrate your way through the game, and if you're very used to prestige modern gaming, you could very well find yourself sinking into this more and more. Ignis is blind, but he says he'll recover soon, so maybe this is just gonna be like a weird one-off chapter and things will get back to normal. Oh wait, no? Oh, now Prompto's gone? Uh, okay, uh, fine, well, we'll find him, and then things will be okay. Oh, I have no weapons, and I can't go back in time to grind or whatever, and my car is destroyed? Over and over, you're sunk into this as the plot moves you deeper into what feels like a big climax. You're in the heart of enemy territory, getting chased around by Arden, uh, Ravis is dead, the opposing king is dead, everything's collapsing, and you find Prompto and the others, and they hold the line while you move to the final confrontation, find the crystal you've been looking for, and it... It sucks you into it for 10 years. <laughs> I, look, I don't want to sound like I'm overstating things here or uh, being melodramatic, but moving into the final part of the game makes this game kind of crash and burn for me. Like, we have such a great setup. Endless time to vibe and get to know this land, its quirks, your friends, only for the story to pull them excruciatingly away from you, bit by visceral bit, to reunite in the depths of darkness and push to the end and instead you're vored by a crystal to talk with the worst version of Bahamut. Look at how they massacred my boy. Ugh. Bahamut's human Sona imparts upon you what you will need to do, the grave importance of your duty. We'll get into it, I promise, but it's such an abrupt and rough denial of a well-built story beat. What happens next? So, you emerge out of the crystal looking like a Rick and Morty fan, the world's in the very boring darkness, and the first real problem I have here is that Ignis's eyesight is, like, fixed? Again, I'm trying to be delicate here, but he has a high-tech looking set of shades, he can cook and fight as he used to, and the text is very... coy about declaring whether or not he can or can't see anymore, and I find that to be cowardice, but hey, if you're more knowledgeable, leave a comment here. Beyond that, things kind of feel like we're shakily getting back on course. The gang's back. You reflect on your photo album. You get to pick a picture to bring with you into the final battle. It's good. A lot of this game hinges on the camaraderie of the boys here, and it's aware of that. A aware enough to have Florence and the Machine cover Stand By Me for the opening song. Stand by. And then you confront Arden once and for all where he instantly fridges your pals so you can have a Final Fantasy-themed Dragon Ball Z fight with him and win by yourself. <laughs> so, like... So, when cornered in public to defend my position that all FF titles are good, first off, no one really asks me outright about 15. It's usually 13 or 10-2 or Final Fantasy 2 or 3 or 12 that are the ones that people think they can couch me out on here, but FF15 is a game that I love the overwhelming majority of. This final chapter sucks so hard, hard enough that I went and read synopses of all the DLC and the movie just to see if the people who made such a big deal about the missing DLC and the deep lore of this game had anything, any answer for why they did this. And besides the cowardice of the Golden Path alternate ending in the Iggy DLC, no. This is how the game goes. They've built a genuinely surprisingly thoughtful game, a take on the popular open-world AAA title that smartly makes traveling to destinations feel thematically coherent by the weighty realism of, like, driving everywhere. There is something stark and grim and potent in this game's visual realism that makes the magic in this world pop. It makes most of the six feel incredible to behold, like you're literally watching something unreal manifest before you in a way that is awe-inspiring and horrifying all at once. And then right at the finish line, they hamstring themselves on making the final conflict be you and Arden shooting swords at each other in a nice suit to make sure the visuals are preserved perfectly. It's a final call that is almost incoherent in a way that no amount of additional context seems to describe. Why put so much 
patient, daring work into setting up a big world that you break apart slowly to make the connection to your companions such a prominent, central concept in your story, only to push them off the table unceremoniously for this fight. You even get one of the credit sequences dedicated to Noctis tearfully telling them how much they mean to him, but, you know, like a cool man sort of way, like no homo. Uh, but that seems tainted by the fact that the game refused to hit a mark so obvious that they had to make a crystal for you in order to not hit it. Now, now, okay, so those of you who've played this game before, hi. Uh, you may have noticed I've conspicuously left some parts of the finale off the table. So what happens after you beat Arden? So I'm gonna do something I usually avoid doing. I've long complained about people who dig too deeply into declaring fiction about royalty pro-monarchy because I, I do not believe there to be a meaningful or interesting critique in that, but I am going to talk about monarchy here and now. So let's take things back a bit. Noctis is the son of the king, and when, early on in the game, his father dies, the burden of his title bears down upon him. He has to go find all the ancient weapons of kings long gone, his legacy written into the very earth one tomb at a time. As his journey pushes him to such lengths, he'll find himself under the imposition of the astrals, who push him to even greater trials while he contends with their power. The game is not at all shying away from the gravity of Noctis' divinity. Where games like Fire Emblem may try to downplay the royalty as a pseudo-divine figure, FF15 drives headlong into this. Noctis is so important that Ignis blinds himself for him, that Gladio, utterly furious with him, continues to protect him with his life. Lunafreya dies for him. Uh, like, the importance and divinity of his position is explicit text. He is important his life more meaningful than others because he needs to ascend to the throne and rule. But of course, that isn't all that Noctis is supposed to do. No, the communion with Bahamut and the crystal reveals that Noctis is to be martyred. The game ends with him on the throne and getting stabbed to death by every king before him until he's obliterated and light returns to the world. This is why I wanted to talk about monarchy in this game. Taken as a whole, this game believes in the divinity of inherited monarchy, but in a way that is wholly symbolic. The existence and complete consumption of a king is paramount. Noctis isn't valued as a ruler, as the head of a governing body. He isn't expected to be good because he's fair to the people or shows himself to be particularly just. He demonstrates kind of none of the qualities a lot of stories about royalty kind of need to extol. When we see Marth in Fire Emblem, we can intuit that it is his right for him to return to his war-torn homeland and ascend to the throne, because he is just and fair and peace-loving and wants to end these conflicts. He raises an army of sympathetic, noble souls, people from all social castes, so even without the whole magic sword and legacy of Henri or whatever, he's a good lad. And it's kind of common practice in these fantasy tales to lean into the comfortable idea that these qualities will make him a good king. Conversely, Noctis is mostly frustrated and upset and tense through most of the game's story as things keep happening to him. He's on his way back home when his father is killed, far away from him, without being able to afford time to grieve. He's pushed in to inherit the royal arms, where he's afflicted by the call of the astrals, which seem to keep him in pain with some irregular headaches as they beckon him. Noctis has surprisingly little agency in his story, just like Jesus Christ, I guess. And the game is pretty smart with how they handle this. He doesn't have agency, he isn't being tested in his capacity to rule because who he is, the kind of person he is, doesn't matter. He is in the right position, in the proper time, facing a real crisis, and his body is needed. He has to be protected and escorted and moved from person to person, to dead king, to overworldly spirit, each in turn bolstering and harboring him until he can be strong enough to kill the usurper and use his life to restore order to the world. So, in the context of the whole of it, the way the game presents itself, the attention it pays to the friendship of his closest companions, the hard, grim edge it paints itself with, all of this manifests in a protagonist that has no agency in his life at all. There's this great video from Innuendo Studios, and yes, I get that I keep bringing his stuff up, he's my Sam Delaney, please, uh, I'm, not a I'm not a freak, where he coins the term protagony, talking about Joy from the new Blade Runner and how she has no agency in what happens in her life and how that's kind of how we are, right? Do any of us living under the thumb of capitalism have agency in our lives to make big choices? 
it's a good video. Watch his stuff. But the point here is that I'm getting that same feeling from playing a character that's divinely important. I get the sense that the game's intent here was to make this world, this story, feel bleak and cruel and rough, that Noctis can find solace in his few trusted friends, and even those are taken away. It's a tragic story. You save the world. You even get that cutscene of him and Luna Freya together in the afterlife, but... I don't know. Doesn't it feel off? Like here, at the crystal core of this game is this tale of a helpless prince born to be made into the world's sacrificial lamb. It's nestled quietly into a story that gives you the veneer of agency and power. You can side quest and drive around the countryside and fish and take photos all you want, but the moment you get close to Lunafreya, the world falls apart. Maturity, growing up for him, is bearing the weight of not being a person anymore. And that's the kind of story most games in the genre would build to in order to subvert at the end. Some kind of way to deny this, to make his life, who he is, the flawed and troubled and hurt person underneath the crown, meaningful. But no, this game doesn't want that. And if it does, it's in an alternate ending through DLC where Ignis has to be saved from beyond the grave by Luna Freya so that they can all have a golden ending that has basically nothing to do with Noctis' actions anyway. The most important character is helpless in the face of his fate, and the story adamantly refuses to have that be questioned. In many ways, this game, a game the developers wanted to advertise as a Final Fantasy for fans both new and old, operates like an anti-Final Fantasy. The series has a history of thoughtful female characters in central roles in the game story. Many titles are about the radical opposition to absolute power, be it royalty or divine. It's a series that often pulls the player down into the depths of seemingly hopeless conflict to find strength in others, to rally and push and fight the brutal necessary fight for a better tomorrow. And then FF15 came out. A game painfully aware of its quiet exclusion of women from the story, a game that extols the virtue and wisdom of the divine, and also a story that consumes the anointed king, almost speaking truth to the series' more radical perspectives. Your gods will use you and devour you. And yet, the only conversation I keep seeing of it is trivial. It's dev cycles and mocking of it being convoluted and impossible to understand because that's just the series' reputation. Very pretty nonsense that we can all dunk on for whatever reason we want. No one likes JRPGs. No one cares about the plot of video games. No one wants games that aren't brutally realistic. And here's this thing. This game that wants so hard to pretend that it's a serious title with blood and violence and tragic girls dying tragically. All to hide the heart of the story. The weird, twisted, almost darkly wicked tale that seemingly no one knows how to talk about. Is this the fate of the series? Final Fantasy XVI released to a myriad of opinions and ideas about it. Its relationship with women, its intense maturity, its dog havingness, and I wonder what has changed. Somewhere in the depths of this shared consciousness online is this unchanging image of Final Fantasy that seems to be the means to beat every new title to death with. Modern Final Fantasy culturally cannot stand to be good, and that is why the largely positive reception of 16 stands out so much. We can only understand 12, 13, and 15 under these brutal conditions as homogenous titles that all have the same trappings and failings of the platonic idea of bad Final Fantasy, to keep our pristine imaginings of every title from our collective youths forever. It sweeps away the shortcomings of beloved icons like 4 and 6 and 9, and denies the existence of genuine depth and thoughtfulness in 12 and 13, and here, looking at the most recent Final Fantasy to be a previous title, we miss the awkward nuances here. The things the game did remarkably well, the moments where 15 couldn't hold it together. We risk losing our capacity to talk about any of these games. We give in to the entropy that is this bandwagon approach to critical analysis. Maybe 16 will break the curse, I don't know. I hope so. Everyone let me know in the comments if I missed my big Final Fantasy 16 hot take opportunity or whatever, but I think this game 
here and now is worth thinking about, and worth thinking about seriously. I think that it is a shame that a series that has built itself on reinvention, on making each game in the mainline so radically different than the others, has been turned into a homogenous mass of games that are just not my Final Fantasy. Special thanks to Alexi Angelica, Bees the One, Caitlin Fisher, Colleen T, United Fruit Company, Joe Anderson, Lewis Wells, Lorez, Maria Aladren, Naray the Redmarked, Nomadic Raven, Pahor, Professor Bopper, St. Rawberry, Thomas Volpez, and Zetetic. Thank you all so much.